This presentation is Operational Related Risks, which is from Best Practices, Part H, Other Risks, and specifically Chapter H1. The objectives of this presentation are to gain an understanding of the various ways that improper or accidental operation can lead to failure, how to construct an event tree to represent operational risks, and how to feed this information into other failure modes. As far as key concepts, operational risks are unique and require some creative thought. They happen more frequently than we think and are part of many risk assessments. They can be caused by operational error, degradation and aging, poor maintenance, as well as issues that occur during operations. Malfunction or improper operations is one of the three inundation scenarios of dam or levee risk. Gate unreliability can be caused by mechanical and electrical failure, an earthquake or debris blockage. It is recognized that there are lesser degrees of failure and that any malfunction or abnormality outside the design assumptions or and parameters that adversely affect the primary function of impounding water is considered to be a failure. However, there's usually an opportunity for successful intervention. The focus of this presentation is on potential failure modes that result in uncontrolled release of impounded water. Most operational related potential failure modes usually lead to overtopping. However, they can also result in unintended early releases or trigger breach prior to overtopping due to long-term elevated reservoir stages. So I will go over several case histories and examples that focus on operational risks. The first case history is South Fork Dam that failed in 1862. And this is a case where there were several operational decisions made over time that impacted the risk of failure. Each of these post-construction modifications is listed here on this slide that adversely affected the ability to safely pass extreme floods. And to point out a couple of those that uh, actions that had adversely affected the ability uh, and then to uh, pass water and the risk associated with this project was that a, a bridge across the spillway um, had supported a, a six and a half foot span was constructed and more specifically iron screens were placed across the spillway to prevent fish from escaping that greatly reduced the spillway capacity and by as much as 40 percent also the dam crust was lowered to widen the roadway so that carriages could more easily pass and again this was built and then the failure occurred in the 1800s. So this is a brief description of the events that led to the failure of the dam in 1889. Reservoir inflows exceeded spillway capacity and those fish screens I mentioned earlier became plugged with debris. The dam overtopped and failed. And to give you an idea of scale, there is a person that is in this red circle uh, that's standing at the breach. The primary consequence center from the breach was Johnstown, Pennsylvania. This dam failure caused the greatest loss of life due to failure of a man-made structure from a single event in the U.S. history until a terrorist attack of 9-11. Again, almost 2,200 people died, about 100 families had perished, as well as close to 400 children. The next case history involves a Tom Sock Dam in Illinois. Uh, this is a ring dike uh, pump storage project. The water is pumped up into the reservoir during nighttime hours when the power is cheap and released during the day to generate more expensive peaking power. The operators routinely stored water on a 10 foot high parapet wall to maximize power production. There was no spillway associated with this project. So the parapet wall encompassed the uh, the ring dike itself and was on the dam crest just to give you some additional clarification. So this is another case of multiple operation problems that led to overtopping failure. Uh, similar to the previous case history that occurred in the 1800s, but again this this uh, failure occurred in 2005, meaning that these failures still are occurring today. 
The ring dike consisted of a concrete face rock fill structure. The uh, lower photo shows the breach of the dam, which is located here. And this material, this is the downstream slope, and this material was supposedly rock fill. But by looking at the photograph and the evidence that was occurred uh, through the breach, it, it appeared to be much more fine grain material, which may have uh, was, was probably more erodible than rock fill and caused some uh, issues in terms of failure. This, this slide also uh, in, includes the outline of uh, the membrane installation and problems associated with installing the reservoir level instrumentation. A cable and turnbuckle system was rigged up to install the reservoir level instrumentation. However, it was located near the intake outlet of the structure and loosened with time and was not reading the correct reservoir level. In addition, settlement of the embankment was not taken into account and the reservoir level sensors were wired so that both the high level sensor and the high high sensor would need to be triggered before an alarm was sent to a control center. The dike failed as a result of over pumping. And so the location of the breach was also the location of the low area of the of the crest and of the parapet wall. So the photo on the left shows the foundation of a ranger's house that was completely destroyed and wiped off the foundation when the breach occurred I mean, from the uh, from the flood wave. And miraculously, no one died. There was five people uh, with the ranger's family, and they just barely made it out uh, alive. The two photos on the right show the path of the destruction caused by the 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 uh, breach itself. The upper photo is an aerial prior to failure. This is the ring dike. And to point out, the ranger's house was down here, and there was a campground immediately downstream as well. The lower photo shows uh, a time after the breach, an aerial. Uh, here was where the ring dike was. The, uh, the uh, flood wave continued on this path, and you can see that it, it uh, caused major disruption uh, downstream in the in the campground area as well as at the house of uh, the ranger's house. It should be noted that that campground um, is typically occupied, fully occupied in the summertime. This failure occurred in the winter months when no one was in the campground, so uh, hence there was there was no loss of life. Fortunately, so debris blockage impacts the spillway capacity in the peak stage that can lead to overtopping. So these are both cases where floods caused debris that greatly impacted the spillway's capacity to release flows. The photo on the left is a dam in Switzerland that was overtop in 1978 when debris filled the reservoir and completely blocked the spillway. Fortunately, the structure was, was a concrete structure and resisted overtopping flows without failing. That is, the dam was a concrete dam. Photo on the right is a Kirkhoff Dam, which is a concrete arch dam that's located on the San Joaquin River in California. Again, it was a concrete dam that was able to resist the overtopping flows without failing. So dams that are located in steep canyons may be susceptible to rock fall or rock slides, which are most prone to occur during rainstorms when the spillway gates might be needed to pass flow. If rock falls are large enough, they can obviously take spillway gates out of commission, perhaps leading to premature overtopping with a breach of the dam. In this case, the rock fall occurred during a rainy period. Therefore, there may be a higher chance of gates being damaged by rock fall when the reservoir is already high. So discussing uh, project access. So the photo on the left shows that the only access road to the dam runs along the, the river that is downstream of the dam, the, the, the downstream channel. So here is the here is the road, the access road, and here is the dam up here, and here is the downstream channel. The photo on the right shows the releases that are starting to erode that access road. So after sustain, sustained releases, the roadway has completely washed out, leaving no vehicle access to the site. This could, this could cause a major problem if this access road is needed to operate critical equipment. 
So discussing uh, limit switch failure, this is a case where a roller gate had opened too far when the limit switch failed. Control of the pool was then lost, and depending on the size of the gate, uh, the magnitude of the uncontrolled release may be small, may be remain in the gate, or may just cause minor flooding, or it could also cause some more major flooding if a lot of water was released. Now, these are examples of incidents that can increase the likelihood of failure to open gates. So the spillway gates for this dam are not remotely operated. So they have to be, an operator has to go to the site to operate the gate, gate, so they must get onto this catwalk to do so. During a flood event, the catwalk was nearly inundated, making it dangerous for the operator to open the gates. In addition, the emergency generator is housed in a location susceptible to flooding from high water and was protected by this makeshift barrier. So it doesn't appear to be a very effective method to protect the generator. For this case, the, the low point on this dam crest occurs at the same location as the switch yard. The large power plant has significant release capacity that can be used to pass flood flows. However, if the switch yard, large, if the switch yard is lost, the power plant will shut down and that release capacity would be lost, perhaps leading to premature overtopping with a breach of the dam. Now, some mechanical and electrical related potential failure modes are listed on this slide. An example of a valve failure is a low flow bypass valve vibration causing cracks in a weld around the valve flange, resulting in a blowout. The failure caused release of water and major damage to the structure. Valve failures typically do not release life-threatening flows downstream, but a valve failure can eliminate access to areas of the project that may be critical to the safe operation of the structure. A control valve can also be left in the open position by an inexperienced operator leading to uncontrolled release. In addition, high water, high tailwater conditions due to spillway releases may inundate a power plant where the emergency generator and other critical equipment are located. Loss of power and emergency backup power, as well as lightning strikes, can impact control systems during major storm events. And also, software error in a SCADA system can cause the gates to open unexpectedly. I'm going to switch, talk a little bit about levees here. Uh, the runoff from storm events within a levee protected area needs to flow eventually back into the river. When the interior runoff reaches the levee, oftentimes pump stations are used to then pump the water back into the river. If the pump stations are inoperable, the levee protected area can become flooded even though it is protected from the river. Often the interior flooding occurs slowly and is non-life threatening, but significant economic damages can occur. If interior flooding is due to malfunction or improper operation, of gate outlets or pumps, then it is considered to be an inundation scenario of a levee risk. If the interior flooding is due to inadequate pump capacity, it's a scenario of non-breach risk. So some levees have storm sewer pipes or culverts that can convey runoff to the river through the levee when the river is relatively low. Backflow valves present, prevent water from flowing into the levied area when the river is high. If the backflow valves fail to close, the levied area can become flooded through these culverts. This type of potential failure mode also includes missing or stolen flap gates or failing to close such devices in time. Again, the interior flooding occurs slowly, is, is most likely non-life threatening, but significant economic damages can occur. So this case history involves a lock and dam in Illinois is a reminder to take a look at upstream impacts that can increase the risk as well. A barge impact during a flood rendered some spillway gates inoperable, leading to overtopping of an upstream earthen dike. These photos show the damage from the incident at the spillway and the resulting inundation of a residential protected area. So here is the spillway. These are where the barges got released and impacted the spillway. And this, of course, is where the dike uh, had failure had occurred and inundated uh, residential area. 
So this slide shows the damage to the spillway gates and trunnion anchorage. The connection to the pier was also completely broken. So this slide summarizes the incident and shows a photo of the runaway barges where they impacted the spillway. So six barges broke free, three sank, impacting five gates and leaving two gates inoperable. The trunnion and anchorage on one of the piers was destroyed, as the previous slide indicated, and the decreased spillway capacity led to erosion at the dam around a boiler house, but it also overtopped an upstream dike flooding a residential community as that previous slide had indicated. So there are a number of, or there are some databases that um, are summarize some of the operational failures that included debris plugging, structural failure, misoperation, uh, both in a national performance of Dan's database and in a, in, in a FERC database. So now switching gears to event trees. Operational issues are usually the initiator of a potential failure mode and thus are placed at the beginning of an event tree. They can impact peak stage and flood frequency and can be incorporated into the results of a fault tree analysis. Many times failure to operate gates is a result of a series of events that do not go as planned. And this sample event tree, a limit switch failed on the spillway gates for a remotely operated dam. An operator is deployed, but all access roads to the dam are inaccessible. Since the operator cannot reach the dam to operate the gates, overtopping occurs in embankment dam ultimately breaches. Given the reservoir loading, the first five events of this sequence are associated with operational events. Given the gate operations fail to go as planned, an overtopping potential failure mode is initiated as seen in these last five events. However, the sequence of events leading to a breach does not progress linearly in a single thread of cause and effect, which we'll discuss on this next slide. So this is uh, an event tree um, in an event tree format of the previous example. So for a given flood loading, the initiator is that the limit switch fails. Follow one branch, the operator is deployed, but the main access road and secondary access road are not passable. Since the operator cannot get to the site, the gate, gate operation is not made and overtopping with breach occurs. Since the operator cannot get to the site, a node for making the gate operation in time is not needed. This is a strictly linear translation of a sequence of events uh, from the previous slide. However, if you only consider this one possible outcome, you would miss other events that could lead to breach, one of which could be the risk driver, and underestimate the risk. Let's look at other possible outcomes that lead to breach. So if an operator is not deployed, the gate operations will not be made and the overtopping with breach occurs. Another potential outcome is if an operator is deployed and the main access road is passable, breach occurs if the operator does not make the gate operation in time. There may be delays with detecting the limit switch failure, making the decision to deploy an operator to the site, reaching the operator to tell him to go to the site, and the operator leaving his current location to go to the site. In addition, when he gets to the site, there may not be time to make the actual gate operation. So this should sound familiar because this timeline uh, was also discussed in chapter C1 consequences. The timeline of human factors is an important consideration for operational related potential failure modes because it may be overcome by the rate of reservoir if it, it is overcome by the rate of reservoir rise. So going back to our Event tree, a third possible outcome is if the operator is deployed and the main access road is not passable, breach occurs if the operator can get to the dam, but the secondary access road by the secondary access road, but cannot make the gate operation in time. Again, the timeline of human factors and travel to the site is overcome by the rate of rise of the reservoir. 
The last and fourth outcome is if an operator is deployed and the main and secondary access road are not passable, the gate operations will not be made and the overtopping with breach occurs. Thus, there are four pathways through this event tree that can lead to an overtopping potential failure mode. So the event tree on the previous slide is not complete. It covered the operational related events that led to overtopping. But to complete the event tree, we must evaluate the embankment dam performance given that overtopping occurs. The generic overtopping event tree was discussed in chapter D3, overtopping failure of dams and levees. So this event tree must be appended to each of the four end nodes labeled overtopping with breach. So here's a truncated event tree that we had just shown previously that shows just the operational related events. The overtopping with breach is R compressed. The total probability of failure is the sum of the end product probabilities of each of the four pathways, similar to what was discussed in chapter A5 of entry analysis. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, closure structures on, on levees. So often there are roads or railroads that traverse the levee alignment. These openings in the line of protection must be closed during a flood event. Closure structures can include slide gates, swing gates, as well as stop log structures and sandbag closures. This is an event tree example of a, of a non-culvert closure structure through a levee embankment or a flood wall. Similar to the last example, there are operational and human factors that are the initiator, and there are multiple outcomes that can lead to inundation of the levee protected area. Let's discuss those adverse factors for each of these events. So let's look at the first node, which is the flood forecast. If the flood forecasting is inadequate, inundation can occur due to many factors, which include upstream gauges and forecasting capability are inadequate to protect the peak water surface that will require closing the structure. Notification triggers are not documented in an EAP, and notification plan has not been recently updated or tested. The second node is placement time. Given that a flood is forecasted, there is insufficient time to place the closure before inundation occurs. This can be due to several factors, which include there is insufficient time to mobilize personnel and equipment and to place the closure. An outside agency, like say a railroad, refuses to grant necessary right of entry. An operating plan for the closure placement does not exist. Personnel are not fully aware that the closure structure needs to be placed due to lack of interagency coordination, knowledge of the operating plan, triggering elevations, etc. Necessary parts, supplies, and equipment are missing or are not easily accessible. Personnel setting the closure structure are inexperienced due to the lack of flood fighting or training and encroachments accessibility issues, damage, debris, vegetation, or operational con conditions actually prevent uh, placing the closure. That concludes the operational related events that include human factors. The third node is structural instability of the closure given that it's been successfully placed in time. Many factors can lead to instability of, of the closure, which include design or construction deficiencies exist, physical condition or operational issue keep the closure from performing adequately, damage to floating debris or vessel impacts adversely affect stability. So now on to the fourth node, which is unsuccessful intervention, which leads to inundation. So the factors that influence that node are the monitoring frequency is inadequate to detect the stress, it is physically not possible to intervene during a flood event. Intervention protocols are not documented in an O&M plan or an EAP. Equipment and personnel are not available to reinforce any distressed area and a different closure method than specified in the operating plan, like placing sandbags, was attempted but failed. So like in the previous example, there are multiple pathways through the event tree that lead to uncontrolled release of impounded water into the levee protected area. So the two previous event tree examples mentioned human factors 
as part of the initiator of a potential failure mode that ultimately leads to breach. Human reliability analysis involves both qualitative and quantitative assessments of the human error. The estimated human error probabilities can be entered into an event tree or fault tree analysis. Though human factors have been recognized as significant hazard in dam and levee safety for many years, they are still not usually integrated into dam and levee safety analysis. The human factors which contribute to the potential for failure can generally be placed into three categories of primary drivers of failure, and those are shown on this slide. Uh, the first being pressure from non-safety goals that include pressure to deliver water, pressure to generate power, personal goals, etc. The second factor is human fallibility and limitations. That can include misperception and faulty memory, limited skill and expertise and others. And the third being complexity of the structure. Large number of interacting system components, difficulty in system modeling, prediction, and control. These primary drivers of, of failure lead to various types of human errors, as well as to compromise risk management due to ignorance, complacency, and overconfidence. Human errors can include slips, which are actions committed inadvertently, lapses, which are inadvertent inactions, and mistakes, intended actions with unintended outcomes. In the contents of dam and levy safety, mistakes are the most common type of human errors that can contribute to failure. That concludes this presentation, and I appreciate your attention.